An urgent call from U.S. cities facing shortages of masks, test kits and ventilators as the number of coronavirus cases grows. Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu and this is The Heat. The situation in the United States is growing worse by the hour with over 100,000 coronavirus cases. On Friday, U.S. President Donald Trump invoked the Defense Production Act to make companies manufacture ventilators and signed a $2 trillion stimulus bill to bring much-needed relief to American workers. Italy reported 914 deaths in just one day, the largest single-day toll reported by any country. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced he has tested positive for COVID-19. And there is also great concern in India, where 1.3 billion people are now in lockdown for three weeks to stop the spread of the coronavirus. Earlier, I spoke with Dr. Shashi Tharoor. He's a member of parliament for the Indian National Congress and served at the United Nations as the Under Secretary General for Communications. I asked him about India's response. The officially recorded outbreak is not very high for a country of 1.3 billion people. It's, uh, it's over 700, though there were 155 new cases today, which is the largest, I think, in any single day. And um, there are more and more reports that the government hasn't confirmed them of cases being transmitted that did not involve travelers from abroad. All our initial cases were either people acquiring the virus abroad or coming into contact with people who had come from abroad. But now we're discovering some examples of local transmission. And if that's true, then we're barely half a step away from a major community uh, transmission of the virus, which could, of course, result in the exponential growth of these numbers. So I think it's far too early for any complacency about the numbers. So far, India's had, I think, 20-odd deaths, uh, not as much as most other countries. Um, and in terms of the fact that it's taken a few weeks to get to this point, Indians have been patting themselves on the back thinking they've done something right. However, the fact is also true that we have done so little testing, largely because of very few available virology labs equipped to do the testing and limitations on how many kits and therefore how many tests we can conduct in a particular day or week that it's quite possible that our infection rate is a serious undercount and that various people have caught the virus without being diagnosed. The lockdown suggests the prime minister and the government have taken this risk very seriously. But it's very difficult to impose a lockdown of this nature in a country so large and with such a, frankly, not very good uh, infrastructure to take care of, of people. So right now we're facing one major humanitarian horror as literally hundreds of thousands of migrant workers are heading back from the states where they're working in India to their home villages, often hundreds of kilometers away, at a time when all railway lines are shut, all trains are shut, all roads are blocked, all flights are canceled. And so literally there are people setting out on 800-kilometer walks um, with their belongings on their back because they have no place to go to. This kind of humanitarian horror is taking place. Uh, there are other calamities as a result of the lockdown. Farmers unable to harvest their crops. Uh, people unable, of course, uh, to earn a livelihood, including many who depend on daily wages to be able to actually feed their families. So we're looking at some very serious problems for those on the margins of Indian society, our poorer and less privileged brothers and sisters. It's a tough couple of weeks ahead, and we've only been four days into the lockdown, and these problems have begun to emerge. Shashi, there has been one study done, and this study has been done by a group of researchers from the United States, from India, and from Europe as well. They've sure. been doing this uh, study for quite some time, for a few years. They're trying to build a model of the Indian population. But on this specific crisis facing the country right now, uh, they show that between 300 and 500 million Indians could be infected by the end of July. The good news is that 90% of them will only show very mild symptoms. But that still leaves 10%. That's between 30 and 50 million people who would have severe infections of the COVID-19 virus. And I'm wondering, 
what kind of stress and burden this is going to put on the Indian healthcare infrastructure, things like hospitals and you mentioned testing and also specialist units like intensive care units. Well, I mean, the honest truth is we will not be able to cope with even a fraction of that number. I think, you know, if India ended up with, um, I don't know, a few tens of thousands of cases around the country, we could probably uh, attend to them. But for example, we don't even have 10,000 ventilators in all of India, uh, and they seem to be crucial when people reach a stage of respiratory distress. If you're talking about a million, let alone 30 to 50 million, there's simply no way that we can attend to all of them. So the, the horrendous danger of that modeling scenario is that it would result in an unprecedented number of fatalities. We just have to hope there are other stories, as you know, number one, that the transmission may not be that bad in India, given the fact that it's taken so long to get to where we have. Second, that the climate may help, that in very hot areas, there is no evidence so far that the virus thrives. The, I think over 90 percent of the recorded infections have been between, um, if I remember correct, uh, uh, 3 and 30 degrees north uh, longitude. So, so I'm sorry, I beg your pardon, 20 and 30 degrees north uh, longitude above the equator. So we are looking at a hot summer coming up. In fact, the heat has already begun here in Delhi uh, in the last couple of days, and it's hotter further south. So there is some hope that if any of those theories are right, the virus may have a tougher time surviving and being transmitted. But we don't know any of this because there's no prior human experience of this COVID virus. And so we're going to be finding out the hard way um, as to whether we're going to be 30, 50 million people uh, uh, literally in critical condition, perhaps a large number of them not making it, or whether we're going to escape relatively likely. Uh, I don't know that this three weeks lockdown will solve it all, but I do accept the argument of the government that it's one thing we have to do uh, in order to ensure that the worst doesn't come to pass. Needless to say, this kind of lockdown is not easy in a country where even those who have homes, unlike the migrant workers I mentioned, right. those who have homes are packed into very, very densely populated urban slums um, uh, with, with dozens of people to a single room and tiny apartments where families are living cheek by jowl. In those circumstances, WHO concepts of social distancing and so on become academic. You can't keep a meter between two people if the two people have barely three or four square meters to live within. And in those circumstances, uh, we are risking that even normal conditions of isolation or self-quarantine could still create infection. So it's, it's, it's a tough time, and we're going to go through a couple of very tense weeks while we cope uh, with the news as it comes in day by day, and we all follow it. Um, there are some journalists who are very critical of the briefings the government's giving, yeah. saying that the government doesn't seem to have a clue. Yeah. There are others who say, let's, let's have faith in the government, let's trust them, and, and see how, how much they can deliver for us. And certainly the level of cooperation with the lockdown is higher than perhaps people would expect of a famously undisciplined country like ours. You know, you wrote an article uh, last month, the middle of February, uh, in the South China Morning Post, in which you said that India has no national surveillance system. Explain that to us, uh, that particular shortcoming of having no surveillance system. How would that impact the spread of a disease like uh, uh, corona? You see, the, the idea is that with a surveillance system, you could trace the clusters of infection. In other words, you would need to do a lot of testing. By testing, which we're not doing remotely anything like the kind of percentage of testing that was done in South Korea or even as being done in some of the developed countries today. In India, we've tested very, very few people. I think if I remember right, we've tested 22,000 people and found 700 odd to be carrying the virus. But if we had tested 22 million people, which is still only a, a fraction of our population, a tiny fraction of our population, would we have found a much larger number? We don't know. And what is more, would you find them in clusters where you can promote community isolation and treatment? I mean, the, the mantra of the WHO is test, trace, isolate, and treat. Uh, we haven't been doing all of that. I mean, to be very honest, we've done very little testing. Um, 
some states, remember that we are a federal system and some of our states have better health systems than others. So my own state of Kerala has been pretty good at tracing. So when a case came in from to Kerala that was COVID positive, they were able to trace every person that person had met since he or she landed in Kerala. Now that is tough enough, but Kerala can do it. Many other states will not have the resources or the experience to do it. Even more, if the cases start coming from people who've never traveled abroad and don't recall meeting anybody who's come from abroad, then tracing becomes very difficult. In very many cases like that, you have a cluster, and then you have to move in aggressively to treat that entire community. Now, these are the kinds of things we really have no track record in doing. Since COVID became a world news item, the government has been doing better to equip and prepare and authorize a larger number of labs to do the testing. There was only one at the very beginning in January that was equipped to do that. That went up to 11. Now they've authorized 52 or 54. I'm not sure how many of them are already 100% game to go. But again, you know, in a population of 1.3 billion, if you're really talking about 50 or 60 percent of the population getting infected, then we will be overwhelmed. So our real hope is that I'm clutching at straws here, that the climate or some other factors might prevent the kinds of numbers that that famous model came up with. Are there any lessons to be learned from the Chinese experience? You know, we know that the infection rate in China is now almost down to zero. The only infections coming into China is from people coming from abroad. Of course, China took draconian action in confining uh, the disease to one specific area of the country. And I know the circumstances are very different in, in uh, these two countries. But are there any lessons that you could take away from there? I don't know that the Chinese model is replicable anywhere outside China. We're discovering right now in the United States where you are that it's not replic replicable in the U.S. and that the number of infections um, is, is going up dizzyingly, exponentially. Um, Italy, similar story, another country like India that's fairly freewheeling, that people don't like to have restraints placed upon them. Um, it's not easy. And, and, and uh, all I can say is if Italy is suffering this way with, what is it, 65, 70,000 cases uh, and, and so many are dying, then I shudder to think what will happen to India is even 700,000 cases, let alone the 70 million uh, that you're talking about in your model. Uh, Shashi, I want to look very briefly at the economic impact uh, that this is going to have on India. The Indian finance minister has announced a $23 billion economic stimulus package. Let's listen to what she had to say. We are looking at both cash transfer as one set of measures, and another set of measures will be food security related. We do not want anyone to remain hungry. So we will be giving enough to take care of their food grains requirement, protein requirement in terms of pulses. So looking at India, you know, as, as I said, a country of 1.3 billion people, how far will this go? We're also talking about a country which has a very large informal economy, small businesses which literally operate from the streets. We have the working poor, there are laborers, uh, domestic help, rickshaw operators. How is this money going to be distributed? Well, first of all, all these people are out of a job and have no income as of the lockdown four days ago. And they're absolutely uh, hand to mouth unless they're supported, which is why the, the cash transfers are so important, but that only works for those who've opened bank accounts. Many of these people don't have bank accounts. They are still in the informal economy. There are estimates that somewhere in the neighborhood of out of the 1.3 billion people that maybe an optimistic figure would be that six to 700 million are banked in one form or the other. That still leaves five or 600 million people whom these cash transfers will not reach. Uh, the other worry we've got is, is that um, some people are on the move, the migrant laborers I mentioned to you, that when you give cash transfers, the problem is the economy is going to take such a blow from all this that the value of cash may actually decline. In other words, money you're transferring that would have been enough to live on for a week or two may suddenly no longer be enough to because prices go up in a, in a situation of scarcity. Uh, all of these things are very difficult to predict and model because no one's ever dealt with anything like this. But you're quite right in saying that in a country like India, which has already suffered the terrible self-inflicted blow of the government's reckless demonetization scheme, which was already 
a, a kick in the solar plexus for many people working in the informal economy, living um, on, on a day-to-day -day cash wage, dependent on liquidity and so on. Uh, many, many businesses, small businesses went under with that. Now they barely recovered getting back on their feet and the hit with this virus and the shutdown that it's imposed. So we're looking at economic devastation. I mean, I, I, I read these articles saying, oh, our growth rates will go down to 3%. And I tell myself, I hope you're right, because the 3% looks like bad news in a country accustomed to above 65 That 3% will be a miracle if all these horror stories come to pass. We may not have a growth rate at all. It's a very, very alarming situation. But the hope, the silver lining in all this is, so far, we have actually escaped the worst. And who knows whether in the next few weeks, with good weather and with this lockdown, which will presumably reduce the risk of infection for a vast majority for three weeks, that we might just be able to dodge the bullet. Shashi Tharoor, thanks so much for joining us, sir. Thank you, Alan. Well, for more now on the coronavirus pandemic, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Atlanta, Georgia, is Dr. Carlos Del Rio. He's a professor and chair of the Hubert Department of Global Health at Emory University. Also with us from New York is Anthony Chan. He's the former chief economist with J.P. Morgan Chase and Company. And my colleague, Nathan King, joins us from the White House. Great to have uh, all of you with us. Nathan, let me start with you. Um, yeah. Things are changing very quickly, as we heard earlier on. Uh, the Infection rate is going up very quickly here in the United States. Yeah. President Trump did speak with uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, on Thursday night by telephone. What did they discuss, and what's your readout of what uh, that call was about? Yeah, the timing of the call uh, was sort of a grim uh, milestone as the U.S. Uh, number of cases was more than any other uh, country in the world. And it's really important that they had this call because they hadn't actually spoken for over a month one-on-one. Uh, 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 -on -one. They were part of that G20 video conference uh, on uh, on Thursday. Uh, and you know that there's been a lot of sort of uh, finger-pointing on both sides, but also the, the U.S. president using the word Chinese virus, which has uh, caused a huge backlash here. But according to Trump, just now in his, um, in his coronavirus briefing, they actually spoke for an hour, over an hour, which is quite incredible. Uh, and he asked President Xi a lot about the Chinese experience. Let's take a listen. Last night, I spoke to President Xi. We talked about uh, the experience that they had in China and all of the things that have taken place. And we, uh, we learn a lot. They've had a very tough experience. And uh, they're doing well, and he's doing well. President Xi is doing very well. But we learned a lot, and we have great communication together. Uh, we're going to be sent great data from China, things that happened that they see that, uh, you know, they've had a They've had an early experience, and uh, we're getting all of that information. So uh, we've had a president for a turn, really, quite 180 degrees here, you know, uh, from pointing the finger to saying, well, let's have a look at your experience. Maybe we can uh, learn something from it. And he just said in the coronavirus briefing that they also talked about potential treatments and cures going forward as well. All right. Uh, Dr. Del Rio, uh if we look at the number of cases in the United States, it's now 100,000. Uh, there's almost 1,500 deaths uh, right now. Uh, the United States still lags in tests, and there is still a dire shortage of equipment uh, in some of the major cities. What's your assessment of what's happening in the country right now? I mean, my assessment is that we have two issues going on, as you say. Number one, we clearly have a, a rapidly increasing number of cases. And number two, uh, we're doing better in testing. We're finding more cases. But we're still having some issues in, in, in some of the supply chain, primarily around personal protective equipment, simply because hospitals are not used to the kind of, of rapid expansion that is necessary. I know a hospital that, for example, consumed in five days what normally would have been a five-month use of personal protective equipment. I think oh, the challenge that we have in the U.S. is we're, we're a federal system, and therefore, we are not implementing national strategies. We're not implementing a national policy. A national lockdown is being given to governors, and then governors are putting it down to mayors and, 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 and districts. And, and therefore, you have a patchwork of policies, and we really no, don't have a coordinated response. And that's, in my mind, causing a lot of difficulties in really having a good, a robust response to this epidemic. And what about the ability of hospitals around the country to cope with this? I and mean, we're seeing some pretty tragic pictures coming out of New York uh, where people are, they've set up tents, for instance, to test people. 
Well, I think New York is having a, a, a just a gigantic epidemic. I mean, they have uh, half the cases or more of the cases in the U.S. In other cities, like for example here in Atlanta, uh, we are we are being stressed, but we're not being no, we're not at that level. In fact, we're doing quite well. We are we're we are being able to to accommodate, and we we see that if this continues, we may be in trouble. Yeah, we may be in New York in a few weeks, but right now, I think we're doing okay. The problem is when when there's some massive influx of patients ha come down, and that happened in a, a hospital here in South Georgia where there was an outbreak related to a funeral and several other things. Many patients came into a hospital, and simply that overwhelms the system. And that is exactly the point of social distancing and flattening the curve. You want to not have 100 patients come all at once. You maybe want 100 patients come over a month. And if you're able to achieve that, you'll be able to deal with it. All right, let me bring in Anthony Chan from New York. And Anthony, uh, you know, as you are well aware, we've been talking about this for weeks right now. There's so much fear around, so much anxiety around, because nobody knows how big this pandemic is, uh, whether we're going to be able to cope with it or for how long it would, uh, it would go on. But one of the stunning figures that came out over the past 24 hours was that jobless claim figure of 3.3 million people. I mean, a lot of people don't even know whether they're going to have jobs to go back to uh, when this crisis is over. Um, and there's also this great fear about a recession. I mean, are we going to go into a recession? Well, I think that uh, the traditional definition of a recession really has to be changed because in a typical recession, you have economic fundamentals that are weakening. And then, of course, the Federal Reserve has to come in to gradually try to improve those fundamental conditions. But what we have here now is actually uh, government policy essentially shutting down the economy, shutting down production, and preventing any demand from taking place. I think that if we really succeed on the healthcare front in perfect social distancing and certainly shutting down the economy so we can starve this virus or certainly slow down the number of infections, we can easily end up closing out 40 or 50 percent of the overall economy. And when you do that, of course, you're going to have a big hole in economic growth. Of course, the 3.3 million should not be a real big surprise when people are simply at home. There is going to be a loss of income, but of course, we just passed the stimulus package. Stimulus package is going to provide unemployment insurance. And in some cases, for some workers, the unemployment insurance checks may even end up being larger than what they were earning before. Right. But even saying that, that's still not enough because what are they going to do with that money? Certainly they have to pay rent and things like that, but they're not going to go to a movie theater. Uh -huh. They're not going to fly in an airline. They're not going to sit down in a restaurant to eat. So again, all that economic activity is shut down. So we definitely will see economic activity contract severely. We're going to have more than a 15% contraction in real GDP in the second quarter. We may have a smaller contraction, but nonetheless, no acceleration of growth. So by the traditional definitions of, of when you have a recession, we can define it as a recession, but it's not the same kind of underlying fundamental movements that occur in a typical recession. Right. Nathan, uh, Anthony talking there about that yeah. $2 trillion uh, stimulus plan that was passed by the United States Congress, and in fact, it was signed into law by President Trump in that building right behind you just a couple of hours ago. Uh, not everybody is happy. Some people see this as a gift to big corporation, but it also helps small businesses. It also helps individuals and families as well. What's the significance of that stimulus bill? Oh, this is hugely significant. You know, uh, I think Anthony's absolutely right. This isn't a financial crisis. This is a healthcare crisis where you're shutting the economy down. So, you know, even compared to the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, this dwarfs it because you have to literally keep everyone, the economy on life support and everyone at home and give them enough money to sort of uh, get through this. So, um, you know, when you say $2.2 trillion, we could actually be seeing uh, more of it. Now, look, there are parts of this the Democrats hate. There are parts of this the Republicans hate. But both swallowed the medicine and basically uh, didn't even need to rally votes. It was a voice vote in the end in both houses with some obstruction. And you look, you know, the Democrats got what they wanted in terms of direct payments, even though actually it, it came from the White House and, and Republicans to begin with, direct payments uh, to people, including gig workers like Uber drivers and delivery people, who, of course, are very important uh, right now. Yeah. Extension of unemployment, uh, health care guarantees and also incentives for companies not to lay people off, right. although some are, but also uh, uh, to keep them employed. But there is a big corporate uh, part of this that the Democrats obviously don't love. There are um, some sort of oversight, although the White House has already started trying to water that down this evening. So, yeah. look, everyone doesn't love it, 
uh, but it had to be done. Right. Anthony, very quickly, uh, could we see Congress look at another stimulus bill very quickly uh, in, uh, in the near future? Well, there's no doubt. I think the Treasury Secretary said it best. This is a program or a package that is designed to last for anywhere from 10 to 12 or maybe even 13 weeks. But if this health crisis persists longer than that, they'll go back and ask for an, a, another supplemental package to continue to try to stabilize the overall economy. This is not going to prevent uh, the economic slowdown or the recession out there, but they're trying to stabilize this so that when we open it up, there is an opportunity for the economy to, to rebound. But the economy is not going to rebound overnight because when you shut down businesses for yeah. two or three months, it just doesn't turn on like a light switch. Dr. Del Rio, uh, a New York emergency room doctor, she shared her concerns with the New York Times. And we know that healthcare professionals have been on the front line of this battle. They're putting their lives on the line here. And this is what she had to say. Let's listen to this. And from our perspective, everything is not fine. I don't have the support that I need and even just the materials that I need physically to take care of my patients. And it's, it's America. And we're supposed to be a first world country. Dr. Del Rey, I've only got a minute left, but how concerned are you about statements like that? I'm very concerned because this is a very tough time to be a, a healthcare worker, and we need healthcare workers. Healthcare workers are very anxious. It's very hard to be in the hospital right now. It's very hard to be taking care of patients when you don't have the equipment you need, when you have tension, and when you realize that you could potentially get infected and you can bring the infection to your family, and, but you potentially can die. So I think there's a lot of tension, and I think people need to realize that supporting healthcare workers and ensuring they have the adequate supplies necessary of personal protective equipment to be able to take care of patients safely it has to be the, one of the most important priorities right now. And very quickly, uh, in the next 15 seconds, do you think it's a wise idea because uh, to, go, to get people getting, uh, go, going back to work uh, by April 12th as the president wants them to? No, I think it's a terrible idea. And I think that, that we need data when the person says, well, we, you know, we can open parts of the economy, parts of the country. Let's get some data. We need more testing. We need more data. And then we can make those decisions. But as Nathan says, we have to shut down the country. Right. We have to literally starve this virus, and we haven't done that. Okay. That's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. As we say goodbye, we bring you images of solidarity from around the world in the fight against the coronavirus. I'm Arlen Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.